and down in here. I'm not sure where, where people are going. Um, so my name is Vern Gunter. I, I work for TELUS. I'm a, a director of security there. Um, on the pamphlet, it says I'm the corporate security officer. So I'm not the CSO. I'm a, I'm a corporate security officer. And what that really means is that I'm responsible to the government of Canada for the different contracts we have and securing data and doing that kind of thing. So just so you don't think I'm the CEO, our CSO, that's us. Um, so thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, I come from Edmonton. Uh, as you might know, last week was about minus 50 with the wind chill. So I really like your liquid sunshine that you have here. I've been really enjoying it. Um, I have a friend that lives here. He works for SAP. He used to live in Edmonton. And he said to me, well, your, your cold is a dry cold. I said, no, I'm sorry. Anything under minus 25 is just cold. If your face hurts when you walk to your car, you're probably living in the wrong place. So I'm really glad to be here with uh, uh, some of your liquid sunshine. I got to experience some of it yesterday as I kind of took a wrong turn. I had to walk all over downtown. So I'm really glad to be here. Um, today I'm going to share with you some details on um, what we're doing as a company to protect you as a consumer um, in the area of, I'm not supposed to stand there, in the area of um, um, telecom fraud. So what we're going to be looking at is SIM swaps, um, number porting, some of the identity theft we have. We're going to talk about the impact that that has um, to you as a consumer and, the, and overall in the industry. Um, we're going to talk about some of the actions that Telus is taking to protect you against some of that fraud. And finally, we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do as a consumer to, to um, protect yourself from that fraud. So who is Telus? Um, I joined the security group. Uh, not too long ago, about uh, a year and a half ago. Um, and previously to that, I was in IT. So I was in about 20 years in IT, uh, building massive systems for our organization. I had uh, an amazing team, group of people that um, implemented things around SAP. Uh, one of our systems uh, has like 10 or six terabytes of, of memory. Um, when I started in the computer industry, I was building computers and I was also selling computer components and that kind of thing and I would go to my customers and give them 128 uh, megs of RAM and I would say you know be careful with this this is this is amazing this is uh, precious this is you know your computer is going to run this much faster with that now we're running at six terabytes of RAM in some of our, our systems that tell us um, right now uh, I moved into the security group we my group personally Focus on focuses on clearances, fraud, identity, law enforcement, um, physical security, and internal investigations. So what we'll talk about today is mostly comes from our fraud organization. When I consider the role in security, um, I did so because working in IT, I could see uh, some of the values of security, and uh, I worked a lot in the auditing area. So I worked a, a year in audit. And uh, going through that, I just I got a lot of uh, interactions with the security group. And I was, um, I was always attracted to it. So I was really glad to move over. Um, it's been the most interesting role I've had in my career. Um, like someone was saying earlier, I was listening to the presentation. Well, it was Krebs. He said, um, back 20 years ago, IT security was just the IT group, but it's gone that, that much farther. Sorry, I was going to go back one. Well, one of the, thing, one of the things I wanted to talk about as you look at this slide and, and tell us does is um, giving where we live. And so that's a little part of that one. That, philanthropic company. Um, one of the things that we do as TELUS is we have a program called uh, Ambassadors and uh, Wise Ambassadors. So what that is, is we provide uh, learning for whatever groups that uh, uh, 
you deem necessary to give uh, instruction to. So I've been involved with groups that have been giving the youth um, some, some ideas about how they can protect yourself in the cyber world, um, how to end bullying and that kind of thing. So if it's something that you're involved in, if you've got some influence over some groups and you want to be, um, you want to be proactive in helping them, uh, it would be good to get a hold of uh, the company. It's a free service. We don't charge for it. It's called Tell Us Wise. Uh, you can get my card after we can talk about it. Uh, so it, it's, it's something that I've found very, very impactful to our community. I'll go on to our organization. So um, you can see here, uh, so there is the CSO. His <laughs> uh, name is Kerry Frey. He comes from uh, the cyber defense uh, the generals, he was a general, director general for cyber defense uh, in the government of Canada. Um, so he provides wonderful leadership to our team. Really our teams are broken up into two different areas. Uh, one is kind of the er internal uh, side of TELUS and then we also have an external facing. So you can see there's many, many directors at TELUS, uh, TELUS security, uh, not just me, um, and different areas that are supported. So you got um, You've got Mark Neppers, who I don't know if you might have heard him speak here before. Uh, he's, he's a single contributor. What, he's called what they call a TELUS Arcade, or a fellow. And what he does is help us with direction on, on where we're going and some of the, the risks that are coming out there. Then we have an, um, a leadership that works on the sales side. Uh, and, and then we have Raglan, uh, who works on our DevOps side. Um, that's as far as I'll go there. I was just going to show you, the two, like I just mentioned, the two different areas that TELUS has um, externally focused. So we have a managed security services team and we also have secu security consulting. It was interesting, I had a vendor the other day uh, ask me if I was going to go to the Mobile World Conference and how he could provide services to us with uh, next-gen firewall and, and, and uh, endpoint protection, that kind of thing. And I had to send a note back to him and say, yeah, we provide that. Here's our link, and I can show you what we're doing. So it was, it was really, really interesting. Um, but there, you can just see a general idea of what we do cover. Um, but here's the here's the part that you've all been waiting for. Um, I'm going to get into uh, what we're doing as a telecom prod. So the purpose of this slide is to help you understand that this is not a. Uh, do you keep on losing me? Yeah. Where should I move? Just over here? Over there. I can't, my notes are here. <laughs> okay. You want me to stay here? Okay. Uh, the purpose of this slide is to really tell you about, uh, help you understand that this is not a tele specific ROM. It's not a tel uh, telecom specific ROM. Uh, it's not Canada, it's not North America, it's global. Um, a year ago, I read a book uh, called The World is, not a year ago, 10 years ago, I wrote, read a book called The World is Flat, and it talked about how commerce was moving all over the world, and um, now you can look at how we've progressed in that area where we can buy something from the US, we can ship it from Canada, or from China, you can get that support from somewhere in the Philippines. So what that also means is bad actors target not only people outside of their provinces, but in every con continent. Um, just to give you the uh, idea of the global uh, scope of this, I want to tell you about um, a fellow that uh, had been involved in SIM swaps in Canada. So um, there was an individual, he was uh, working, um, performing SIM swaps and uh, targeting folks in Ontario, Alberta, BC, and the US. Um, so what we did is we were tracking some of his information. We knew exactly who he was. Uh, and we worked with the Montreal police and said, we know who this guy is and we know he's committed massive frauds. We're talking in the area of $50 million US and several hundred thousand dollars Canadian from folks. So he, what he would do is go and uh, perform a SIM swap and then go in and steal the, the cryptocurrency that these folks had. Um, so we worked really hard with the Montreal police. Uh, they finally got in and said, 
well, we can't really help, but because the crimes are actually being committed against people in BC or somewhere else, or even the US. We finally convinced him to do so, and I don't know, you can look up his name, because I can say this now, because he's in the media. Uh, his name is Sammy Vinsaki. He's an 18-year-old, sitting on his couch, making $50 million, funding his parents' house, uh, and his lavish lifestyle. So you can see, this is, this is not minor. Uh, there's guys that are, that are out there and making terrific money doing this. Uh, it's, much more, it's much better than going in to rob a store. Uh, if they can make $50 million from their couch, that's what they're doing. Uh, you can see here um, the different areas that I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, the number ID and, color and uh, spoofing, which I know uh, many of you are a victim of. You'll, you've gotten those emails before. You've gotten uh, uh, calls talking about uh, they're from the CRA and they're going to take all your money or they're going to put you in jail because your SIN number has been compromised. We're highly involved with that. Um, we're also involved in the email and, uh, email and SMS phishing or smishing. Uh, we're working very hard in, in ways to uh, combat that. Uh, and lastly, I'll talk about the SIM swap and the porting. Um, it's important to, to separate um, subscription fraud and, and SIM swaps and porting. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of describe to you kind of the telco lingo that we use when we talk about these things and how it impacts you. So subscription fraud is when users steal personal information and they use it without your knowledge to obtain goods or services. For example, what can happen is uh, they will buy that ID that uh, Krebs was talking about on the dark web and go into a store and say, my name is Vernon Gunter and I want to add a phone to my account. Um, and they'll end up doing that, they'll take the phone they can get it for zero down or, or, or whatever, and they go out and sell it. And these phones are worth $1,500. So you can imagine if somebody goes in and says, I want to add four phones to my account, they're walking with $6,000 worth of goods. That sounds like a victimist crime because we're a big corporation and we can afford it. But what happens is that that gets passed on to the consumer. And that's where it gets a little bit painful, where you are funding some of these folks um, indirectly. Um, Account takeover occurs in two common ways, so that's the SIM swap and the number porting. They're kind of the same thing. They have the same end result. Uh, porting is the same, you know, you look at what they do. So in SIM swap, they'll go to a store, intercarrier. So they'll go to tell us and say, I need to port my number onto, sorry, I, you, I want to port Vern Gun Gunter's number onto this phone, and they'll do that. They move the number over and then they have access to all the, the information they need where they can do account resets using SMS or something like that. Number porting is a little bit different. They'll go to a different carrier. So they'll go to Rogers and say, I need, I'm Vern Gunter and, and I want to move my phone from Rogers or from Telus to Rogers. And in that, what they do is um, they don't have to give a lot of information because the CRTC uh, mandates us to make it very easy to port from, from local from carrier to carrier. So that's a, that's a different way that they are, ab are, are able to uh, obtain your number, but a very real way. And it, it's actually, SIM swaps have gone down for us in the last little while, and porting has actually gone up because they've discovered it's easier and our controls are stopping on the SIM swap side, um, but porting is very easy. Well, sorry about that. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about that, um, that real-time fraud detection. So this is more about the handsets. And like I said, when they steal handsets, it's like insurance fraud. It looks like a victimless crime. But what is happening is that your, the cost of your uh, device is going up. Um, you're also funding uh, these folks like Sammy. Uh, 
in a, in a certain degree, um, if this happens, you can imagine going up to Sammy and giving him 50 bucks out of your wallet and saying this is to your payment for your next uh, Mercedes AMG. As well as the current controls we have um, and the real fraud detection project, we have, uh, so we have a lot of controls that, that uh, we're working with and that has to do with a lot of the, um, uh, uh, like the Equifax and that kind of thing where we check to see if uh, folks are who they are. Um, we are working quite uh, diligently at that, at looking at um, real real time detection. So what we're working with is some AI analytics and that kind of thing, to be able to really look at uh, who you are and what what's been going on in the account in real time, and, and we can identify fraud. But with all that, we put these controls into place, and we have to have the real, a real good balance on uh, on providing good customer service and also um, detecting for fraud. So one of the, you know, I think about my mother. She, um, she doesn't like it when the, the telcos ask her, you know, what's your PIN number or something like that, because she forgets it quite quickly. Uh, so we have to find methodologies to be able to detect fraud and make, make sure we can uh, secure I, your identity without really doing those kinds of things and making it inconvenient for you. So that's, that's what we're doing. Um, there are some methods that we're using right now. Um, so when someone obtains a has handset uh, and illegally, we know where that handset is and we can actually lock that handset. Um, and that has to do with uh, getting right into the phone and so they can't re-enable that phone in North America. Uh, unfortunately, they're, in, they're able to do that within some of the places, like in China, they don't subscribe to that list, that IEMI. Um, locking list. So, uh, unfortunately, some of our phones are going overseas after they've been they've been stolen from us. And then I've already talked a little bit about machine learning and the uh, real time detection that we're doing. So, in this one, we're going to talk a little little bit about uh, the email side of things and and the the phishing side of things. So, I don't know if. Uh, just a show of hands, maybe who in here has ever got those emails where they're, uh, they look like they're from another company and they're, they're tempting you to tick, to click on it. So maybe if you got a text or email, has that ever happened to you? And I think it's close to 100%. Uh, TELUS is working um, to stem some of that. Uh, we have to constantly change our system and process to block those methods, but we are working to do it. Um, one of the things we do is, is a, working a lot with uh, educating our people and, uh, and through the TELUSWISE program, some of our customers, um, to make sure that they understand what phishing really is. Um, I, I, I've become the de facto tech support for my family, where my mother will call me and say, I've got this email that looks like this, and I, whatever you do, don't click it, don't click it, I don't want to. Uh, and, and, so I've now got my whole family paranoid about clicking on anything. So I think they're actually missing some things because they're clicking, they're not, they're not actually executing on some things where they think they've, where it's an actual, um, a real uh, email. Some of the other things we're doing is um, we are actually shutting down some of the phishing sites that you see. So as they come in, um, uh, we have a T-cert team, so a, a team that is constantly watching and they will be shutting down some of the sites that, um, that come up. And again, I say we talk about educating our customers, employees about phishing. Um, at work, it's almost a joke now um, when they're doing these phishing tests. So what they do is they send us fake emails and try to test us to see if that we're susceptible to it. And it's almost a joke to see who, who got, who in security got busted with the last phishing email and it's quite embarrassing if you do. So in security, we're very careful, and we kind of make fun of the people outside of security as well. Some of them are my good friends in the IT area. So um, a lot of work being done to educate our folks on, on, on uh, phishing. So here we'll talk a little, about, a little bit more about the SIM swap. Um, and the number porting that's happening and what we're doing about it. 
So one of the things we're doing in the SIM swap space is that we've uh, removed all the abilities for people to um, to call in for a SIM swap. You actually have to show up in person, like like um, Krebs was talking about. Now there are people that are immobile, uh, and we are making exceptions to those and, and working with those people. But it's, it's something that we feel very strongly about trying to protect you. Um, there are so many ways that they can call into a, a, a call center and and fool the people in the call center. You've probably seen stories uh, where they mimic the actual, they'll, they'll actually do the call and they'll show you how uh, the poor agents are getting um, getting uh, socially engineered and you know they'll, they'll, ha they'll have a noise in the background with the baby crying and say, oh, can, I don't know my password but my baby's crying, can we just get this done? And, and the agents, unfortunately, because their job is customer care, they fall for that and they end up doing the swap and then we, we get into some trouble. Uh, the other thing we're going to be doing um, is enabling two-factor SMS for text for authentication. So what is going to happen is when a SIM swap, and I know it doesn't make a lot of sense because in real SIM swaps you've lost your phone, but we'll be sending out um, a text message that says, are you porting your phone or you're SIM swapping your phone? If you are, answer yes. Um, and th what that is going to do for us is make sure that that's actually happening. There's other ways that we're going to be uh, um, making sure that you understand that your phone is, is basically under attack, but those are the ways we're looking at right now. Right now in porting, we've already enabled the one-way SMS text notification. So if someone tries to port your phone, uh, you'll get a text message and it says, uh, we see that you're porting your phone and then you can call in to tell us and try and, uh, if it's not true, you can call in to tell us and try and rectify that. Um, again, we're at educating and creating better, better awareness for our customers in this space. Um, there's been lots of media coverage on that area. Um, we're ma maintaining a, a secure self-serve portal uh, without impacting customer experience. So if, if you're looking for a swap or something like that, you're going through, um, you're going through those channels. Um, the other thing that we're doing is working a lot um, with, uh, tele with uh, banking, the banking industry. So as a group of the telecoms, we're getting together with the banking industry and, and looking for solutions uh, that's going to help us with this. One of the solutions that we're looking at is actually implemented somewhere else in the world right now. And that solution is um, when a SIM swap occurs or a porting occurs, we're going to keep a list of those numbers that were impacted by that. And then when the banks uh, get a request to change passwords or a cryptocurrency gets a request to change passwords, they'll look back to see if that number has, is on the list of, of something that's been re recently SIM swapped or ported, and uh, they'll stop that transaction right away. They'll stop the reset of the password, so you're, you're safer there. The last thing we're, we're doing is uh, some uh, voice biometrics. So a lot of the companies are doing this right now. I think Rogers is doing it, some of the banks are doing it, and we're going to be looking at, um, so in the, we'll be looking to verify you with your voice as you call in to tell us. Um, if you're going to be changing anything on your account or anything like that, uh, really helping us with um, some of the uh, the fraud that's going on. Just a note on that: it'll be an opt-in type of service. It won't be that you know we're going to be recording your voice voice all the time. You're going to have the the choice to do that. So what will happen is you'll you know the agent will say, "Can we use your voice as authentication next time?" And you'll say, "Yes, I want to do that." And then we'll use your voice as authentication. So you don't have to remember those pins and that kind of thing. Like Krebs said, we want to get away from, from pins and, and, uh, and passwords because it's not the place that is most secure. So this is about the uh, spoofing and that kind of thing that you get. So that's the biggest complaint I get from my family is how come you guys can't stop those CRA calls? Um, how come you can't stop people pretending to the RCMP and telling my sin's been blocked and someone's been murdered in my car? Um, the, it's very difficult to do that. But what the CRTC mandated us to do that in, in December. And we have um, 
So on the wireline side, that means your home phone, we have instituted uh, blocks uh, for irregular phone numbers, and that means numbers that are coming from overseas, so like a 011 or whatever it's going to be, uh, we've put in some blocks when they're, they're spoofing from that kind of number. Um, we also launched a call control feature, so uh, you can determine what calls actually make it through to your home line. For wireless, we are working on that. It hasn't been mandated yet, uh, so we are working on kind of duplicating some of those features um, into our wireless uh, domain. Uh, one of the things that CRTC is asking us to do is something called stir and shaken. So I, some of you in the room might know about what that is. Uh, what it is is really a common way across all the, the telecoms to be able to share um, authentication between the calls so we know that the number that's coming to your phone is actually the number that it's calling from. There is a big challenge in that area. There's many different kind of network types, uh, so it's going to take a lot of collaboration to come together as an industry to make this happen, but uh, we're not giving up on that. Uh, some additional measures we're doing. We continue to uh, pursue uh, solutions with CRTC mandate to be able to trace the origin of calls. Um, and ag again, we're, we're looking at implementing caller ID and authentication across the board. Um, so that's what we're doing as an industry. Uh, Krebs was talking this morning about the fact that some industries really don't care about your privacy and data, and I don't know if he's still here, but I disagree. Uh, TELUS does care about what's going on um, with your privacy and data. Uh, so what I wanted to do here is kind of switch it up a bit and talk about what you can do to protect yourself. So one of the things I'm encouraging my family to do is stop using the mobile number for your, for your authentication or for your SMS password resets and that kind of thing. I've gone in and no one knows my mobile phone number anymore. They don't come through. Uh, when I ask for a password reset, they come through different means. Um, and I've been encouraging my entire family to do the same. They think I'm really paranoid, but I've seen some of the, the bad things that are happening out there. To even go further on that one, where it's possible, use a software authenticator like Google Authentication Services or even a hardware uh, type uh, security. Some of the banks are not there yet, uh, but we're expecting to be pretty soon. So at some point in time, you'll be able to totally eliminate that, that SMS reset. The other thing you can do is call your provider and ask for port protection. Now, I know this is being recorded, but I'm not allowed to advertise what port protection is because the CRTC wants to make sure that you have the ability to transfer your phone from carrier to carrier. But you can call your, uh, your provider and say that you want port protection. And what that means is it takes away that easy, easy ability to uh, do that porting uh, from carrier to carrier. You can say, I want port protection. I want to give you a passcode to be able to do any kind of porting. I, if you, it's something that really everybody should do, because um, you don't. It, although you want the convenience of moving a carrier to carrier, uh, you want to be protected. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, brush up on your your phishing knowledge. Um, learn to kind of spot the signs of phishing, um, and smishing. Uh, it's something that I've been, like I said, I've been doing with my family, and it's sometimes to my detriment. Um, but if you ever receive a suspicious message, contact the organization. So what you do is when somebody contacts you, uh, instead of giving them information, say it's Visa, you turn around and call on a different phone back to Visa and, and, and give that information. And I say a different, um, the different phone because there's ways that they can trap that call when you call back and they can still continue to pretend to be that, that organization like Visa or whatever. Um, and the last one is, so if your phone unexpectedly loses connection and it says no SIM card detected or something like that, um, and now I know you can't call on that phone because it's, it's disappeared, but find a way immediately to call uh, the, the provider that you're with or the bank, or uh, in some cases call, you know, if you're a crypto millionaire, call that cryptocurrency exchange right away and make sure you lock down that account. I don't know if there's a lot of crypt crypto millionaires in this group, 
but it's it's so important to to keep aware of this so this is the slide that when I was listening to Krabs this morning, I was like, uh, maybe I should take this out because he thinks that every company is not working diligently to protect their customers and data. But I didn't. I left it in there because um, we are. Uh, we uh, we have a massive group. We have a, a massive group of security professionals within our organization. We also have a privacy and data group that is constantly watching to see where our data is at TELUS and, and how it might be compromised. So we can see that this type of fraud is increasing, um, mostly because the value of the assets that they can get, get, get a hold of. Um, we also see other breaches happening, like the Desjardins breach. Uh, we can see that impacting us. So when that data gets onto uh, the dark web, they then try and turn around and, and do a SIM swap reporting uh, with TELUS to be able to get your information. So. Couple reasons why we see that going up. A guy can sit in his basement, like I said, and make $50 million in, in two years. Um, while there's been improvements being made, um, we have to continue collaborating. So I know there's partners in here, there's uh, different companies in here. We have to collaborate to be able to, to figure out how to uh, mediate some of the risk of this fraud. Um, and at TELUS, we're working proactively to, to halt the incidents of when they occur. So we're continuing to work and invest incredible amounts of money into our fraud systems to make sure that you're protected. So I didn't take this out because I truly believe that TELUS, uh, and some of the other carriers as well, because I have consortiums with the other carriers. Um, it was very interesting when I joined the group, I came from the IT area, and the thought of actually talking to Rogers and Bell um, about some of our practices was unheard of, because in the IT we didn't share some of our um, some of our processes and some of our technologies, but I'm so encouraged by uh, what happens in the telecom industry, uh, where we actually sit down and talk about what we're putting in, uh, what we can do as a group to to talk about the talk to the um, financial institutions. It's an, an amazing collaboration effort that's happening between the, the telcos in Canada. So with that. If there's any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to, to, to field them. Sure. So the question was, do all financial institutions participate in the checking of numbers? Not yet. Um, it's not happening yet in Canada. We have, we're still building it. So it's happening in other in some, I think it's an African country, Zimbabwe or something, they've absolutely stopped SIM swaps, SIM swap frauds, uh, because of what they've been doing. So we're looking at it in Canada. It hasn't been implemented yet. Oh, great. A colleague of mine, Terry. So the question is, how long do we foresee it that we're not going to be needing passwords anymore? I wish it was next month, year, but I'm not going to try and predict the future. We are working on different um, identity structures to be able to help our customers, but I might say that it will be a couple years. Because like Krabs was talking about, we expected it to be happening already, and it hasn't, so we might be stuck with passwords for a while. Thanks, Terry. Go ahead. So you're asking about what we do. So when we sell a phone,
That's really interesting because we don't have a lot of control on the devices themselves. Uh, we can put some software in it, but we're quite limited to what we can put on to the phones as they sell them. Uh, in corporate security, we're also in, in, involved in investigations. And I heard a call uh, where a fellow was calling into our call centers, and he was irate. He was saying that we put all these things on his phone. We, you know, you put all these applications on my phone. I have all these casino apps and all this kind of thing. You guys are putting stuff on my phone. No, we didn't do that. Uh, you know, aside from, uh, so at the point of sale, we don't do much to be able to help in that area. But what we do provide is support after the fact, where you can go to the Telus site and look at right now at some of the areas that you can be looking at in to secure yourself. Um, and also that WISE program, that Telus WISE, uh, really trying to educate the consumer on on how they can protect themselves. So I've seen that Tell Us Wise program go to uh, senior citizens. We go to senior citizens' homes and we talk about uh, what it really means to secure your phone. Uh, and it's it's quite an, uh, an amazing experience to be able to see their eyes light up and say, what, I, I didn't know this could happen. I didn't know that I should have a password in my phone even. Uh, so through that Tell Us Wise program, I think it's a, it's a good room in. But you, you raise a really good point that yeah so I don't know if you heard his comment but you know what is the TELUS rep doing or the the channel partner doing to be able to educate people as they take the phones um, and I you know, to my knowledge, you're not doing that. And I think you raise a really good point, and I'll take that back, is something that, that we can be looking at is, you know, as I give you a phone, I'm giving you uh, keys to a very dangerous kingdom, and this is how you should protect yourself. Great point, thank you. Right there. Yeah, there very well could be. So I'm not totally sold that the future is biometric authentication um, because there are, you know, you get your deep fakes on with video, you get your deep fakes on voices that are possible. The, the vendors that we're talking to, uh, they assert that you will not be able to crack our systems using a deep fake today. But that doesn't mean they won't be able to tomorrow. Like I said, the fraudsters are always changing their their uh, their methodologies, and as we put something in, they'll find ways to get to it. So, you know, I think that the true uh, the true area of of identification is going to be a digital identification that you're passing back and forth uh, to your to your suppliers or you know to your, whoever's providing you service. Really good point. They might do that. Go ahead. We've talked primarily to the uh, to the banks about it, but you raise a good point that we could be talking to other organizations to make sure that they can they can dip into that area. That's a great idea. So I'm not saying yes, we do, but I'm taking it as a note. <laughs> Anyone else? We have a couple more minutes. If you ever want to drill your telco. One way over there, yeah. We haven't gone down that road yet. Um, uh, 
but I think it's something that we will be looking at. Like we talk about digital identification, it's something that we're very interested in and because we want to get rid of passwords, we want to get rid of the pins and all that kind of thing. Absolutely, uh, you raise a really good point that, that we should be looking at different ways with digital identification to be able to identify our customers. Yeah, fabulous, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Well, with that, thanks so much for uh, allowing me to come out today. It's been a great experience for me being at this conference, and I'm really grateful that you that you stuck around, that you got two more sessions to go. So thank you so much, and I, I, I wish you the best for the rest of the week.